So hello and welcome once again to Cherry Road TV. I'm Ian McNay and today my guest is Hazel O'Connor. Hi Hazel. Hello. And Hazel's been very active over the, her, her career. She's done many, many different things. Obviously she's best known for Breaking Glass, the film that came out many moons ago now. She's also recorded 15 albums. I have a couple here. Um, Cover Plus, which has just been reissued. And Here She Comes, which is a fairly new album that came out about two or three years ago. She's had an incredible life, very, a very kind of dramatic life at times. And we're going to have to squeeze it into the programme because there's so much to talk about. So, Hazel, I wanted to have like a depth in this interview. It's not to be just, then this happened and that happened. And there's one thing that I picked up from the book, which I should mention as well, which your autobiography, which has been out for time now, which is... Which is really, a really, again a really good read, and it's when you were very young. What you used to do was you used to go out in the estate where you lived, get yourself lost, because you wanted to be able to find yourself home again. I think you're only five or six years old then, and that kind of typified your life. I think, didn't it? It's pretty bizarre behaviour, isn't it? <laughs> Possibly lock me up for that. No, uh, I think I just wanted to. Yeah, I, I've got a head like this. I work in mapping in my head. It's the same as when I'm on tour. When I drive somewhere, I see it in my head already where we're going. And I think that's the same thing as what I used to do when I was a kid. I wanted to map where I was going. And I think it's the same as living life. I map it. Sometimes it's not very healthy. It's a bit OCD, possibly. But you took the risk at that very young age of kind of getting lost and not finding home just to just to develop your mapping, basically. Yeah. yeah. I once was lost, <laughs> but now I'm found. Yeah. 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 And also, again, it talks about in the book, your childhood, and you had, you had periods where you were kind of very depressed and would burst out crying at school. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't a smooth ride, was it? Yeah, but I think uh, that was puberty really kicked in and puberty affected me um, quite strangely because I, I didn't have a father living with me anymore. I loved my dad big time. I was a daddy's girl. And um, when they split up, I was about eight. So when I hit my early teenage years, I had my first kind of big love. And um, it was disappointing, really disappointing, yeah. yeah. And it freaked me out and I got freaked out. And then I started this behavior of getting upset about things. But luckily, I had a great school teacher called Miss Bates, who was not a very beautiful looking woman at all. And uh, we used to call her the witch, actually. And she walked like Spotty Dog in, <laughs> in the wooden tops. And she had these little kitten heels. She had a big nose and a jutty chin. And she took me aside one time at school and she said, Hazel, um, look, you've got a lot of advantages and you're missing it all at the moment. You're popular. You're athletic, you're a happy, have been a happy child or young girl. And now I see you doing all this stuff and it's okay, you can cry for a bit and all your friends will go, ooh, you know, what's the matter, da, da, da. And then one day you'll become boring. <laughs> and then you'll realize nobody will come and pat you and love you and do that. And I just took it on board because she told me some of her life story, which was horrific. She'd had a terrible upbringing, much worse than my own sort of little sadnesses. And I stopped. I just stopped it. I thought, she's right. I, sh I can't behave like this. You were able to stop her, okay? Yeah, well, you know, over a period of time. I mean, I used to have to go and see a psychologist, <laughs> Miss Woolard. But I never told her really what... I didn't tell her what I think she wanted to know. And I couldn't because I was a teenager yeah. and I'm thinking, just get off of my case. I'm not telling you anything, woman. Um, you know, especially because you're sitting there with a benign smile going, yes, yes. No, but uh, Miss Bates really sorted me out. Yeah. It, it, it was like, you know, cop on girl. This is real life. And if you live your life like that, you will always be unhappy. You have be a victim. Yes, yeah. and I've spent a long time in my life being a victim. You know, I've fought against it. Um, and I probably do or have in the past gone around with like a V on my forehead. But I don't want to be that way. 
And at 16, you went to Morocco, which is incredibly brave. No, I didn't go. I wasn't that brave. I went with my friends. Yeah, uh, but it's still, it's still, it was still a big thing in those days to, uh, to go and travel as a fairly young. And now people have gap years. And yeah. It's... Well, it was we, we were chaperoned. Her sister was older okay. than us, but we got fed up with being with the sister. She was an anthropologist, and she had friends in Casablanca. So me and my best friend went with her to Casablanca, got bored, and um, I said, let's go to Marrakesh on our own. So we got a train, went to Marrakesh, and um, when I was in Marrakesh, I was raped. Um, my friend had got an illness. That's why she wasn't even where I was when I was raped. Otherwise, probably the rape wouldn't have happened. But as a consequence, it flipped me out so much. I obviously wanted to get out of Marrakesh, you know, like the wind. We went back to her sister in Casablanca, but I didn't want to stay with them anymore. And I hitchhiked then up to Spain, where my boyfriend was, and went to Ibiza, which sounds a bit mad, but it wasn't mad. It was... It was a reaction and um, and I wasn't right in the head by then and I certainly wasn't right emotionally. And I had an awful lot of horrible, more horrible adventures, hitchhiking on my own up to blooming Ibiza, stupid. But I, it, I reactive person. And uh, when I got back to school, after the summer holidays were over, I just didn't feel the same. I didn't feel like the, you know, 15, 16 year old that had gone done her, um, her O-levels, gone on holiday with her friend's sister, um, playing hockey at school in my navy blue knickers. It wasn't me anymore. I just thought, this is, I'm, you know, I've lived through something really weird and I don't want to be part of this schoolgirl trip. So I got myself into art college. And that was your passion before music, wasn't it? it was yeah, art, yeah. It was art and fashion before? Yeah, I was never really a musician at all. It was my brother that was a musician. Uh, but I used to sing a lot with him because it made me happy. And that was something that has always resonated in my life, the happiness that singing brings. But um, I used to love just drawing. I found all my old drawings and they would be things like uh, uh, Miss Snooty or Miss Fashionable. I have this little book still and it's all these little pictures. When we were watching Coronation Street, I'd be writing like, these people, these characters, these frocks, these Mary Quant type things. But my mum, you see, was a hairdresser and she had a hairdressing salon. And um, some of her staff were very, you know, very modern. They were mods and the guys used to wear eye makeup. So I saw all that. I was exposed, exposed to wonderful things since I was about 11, really, through the hairdressing trade. And I was also a hairdressing girl, you know, shampooist. And then you, you went to live in Amsterdam for a time. Well... Yes, because I got into art college, hated art college. I liked it, but I hated it because I wasn't really equipped for it mentally or, or emotionally. And uh, it seemed to me that all the girls in my year were two years older than me because most kids go to you know college when they're 18. And I was doing a pre-degree course a year earlier and I was doing my A-levels at college and doing the same course as them. And I, I, I wasn't equipped really. And all the people that were, you know, sleeping with the tutors got on really well. And I used to think that's terrible because I was still thinking about them as, you know, school teachers, you know, Mr. So-and-so and Miss So-and-so. Whereas we're now in the grown-up world in college. And, um, and I didn't understand some of the big words they used. And I did some artwork there, which, funnily enough, has ended up... <laughs> ended up on the, um, you know, the forecourt of my first art college was Hazel O'Connor. But, uh, you know, when I left, uh, my name was Muck because I just took off uh, and I wasn't going to do that anymore. And I decided I'm going to go to Amsterdam and, you know, be a hippie on Dam Square. That's all I had. I just had this picture. This is where I'm going. And uh, the reality was a bit different. But not much different, actually. You had this free spirit, didn't you? That's yeah. the important thing. You were following the adventures wherever, they, wherever, wherever it took you. Yeah, but it's a little dangerous sometimes. You know, I yeah. did find myself in fairly strange and dangerous positions, but I tended to get out of them, um, which is, you know, lucky. But didn't you get raped again in Amsterdam? I did, and I used to, and that was really sad because I spent a lot of time, as all hippies did in those days, 
going to the Hare Krishna temple every Sunday because you got fed for free and you sang Hare Krishna and it was a great day, you know, it was like a party. And one of those Hare Krishna lads wearing saffron used to come to our squat because I lived in a crack, they called them cracked, cracked houses and not a crack house where people smoke crack. It didn't exist in those days. A cracked house in, in Dutch was a, a squat. So I had a little room in a cracked house called the factory and it was quite a, you know, a militant one uh, where you had a leader of the house and you had to go and ask, can I make a room out of this place? And yes, I could. And there used to be this um, Hare Krishna priest that came in and give sweets out to everyone, which is part of the Hare Krishna way by giving prasadam, you're giving spiritualized food. But he was a little bit obviously weird um, and he hopped on top of me one day and stuck his willy in my mouth. Yeah. You know, I'm making light of it. it of course yeah. it wasn't light, it was yeah. a total freak out for me. And the fact that I didn't bite his willy off, I, I hate myself for, or kick him in the bollocks or something. Yeah. But these are things that people who've been raped think about afterwards. You know, you, you, you're so cross with you yourself. You freeze at the time, I guess. Do you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just think... You don't think. You're going, oh, my God, oh, my God, you're afraid. And then it's only afterwards you're angry with yourself that you didn't do all these things. And I've spent all my life going, I should have done this, I should have done that. But I didn't. And what I did do was never go back to the temple again, which is sad. I mean, I did years later, but that comes in yeah. later in the story. But, you know, there's something that kept you going because then you ended up as a go-go dancer in Tokyo, which again is a huge thing to do. You're still a teenager. You've had bad experiences in life, but there's something still driving you. I, I want more experience. Uh, did I want more experience? No, I actually didn't. I was in love with a, who I think was the love of my life. This is Adrian, who Adrian, you talk about yeah. in the book, yeah. And, um, but it was, <laughs> Adrian kept getting on my case about not earning my own living. And then he started really jabbing me about being a hippie and how I'd lived off men in my life and, um, you, hadn't contributed to society in any way and certainly not contributed to our household. So I took the ump and I saw an advert in Stage magazine which said showgirls and go-go dancers for Japan and it happened to have equity contracts, which equity contract means you can actually then become an actress in a movie. So it sort of fitted in and I got that job. Uh, I, was, I wasn't a great dancer. I was the one that went left when everybody else was going right. But I learned, you know. Yeah, I think you I think you underplay yourself. I just think you've got tremendous guts doing these these things. But <laughs> no, but it wasn't because I didn't want to go. I wanted to go home and and yeah. say I've got a job. By the way, Adrian, and and so then you were proving to him you could be independent. Yes, yeah. I wanted him to turn around and say don't go, but he didn't. Yeah. So I had to go. <laughs> yeah. And then what kind of triggered your your interest in music? Okay, well, um, it was when I, Adrian and I finally came to an end and we did have many adventures because it got me going to Beirut, civil war I was in the middle of, got back to being with him and somehow it was tarnished, our relationship, and it f came to a conclusion. And after that, I didn't know what I wanted to do because every, my raison d'être had been him since I was 19 and now I'm 21. And I didn't know, I honestly didn't know what I wanted, but I did know that something weird was happening called punk, <laughs> that my brother was involved in this revolution, that when I read, uh, you know, all the music papers, there was all these crazy acts going on like Sex Pistols and The Clash and uh, Stranglers and, Buzzcocks, and then I saw my brother was supporting the Buzzcocks, so I went to see him. And he was in a band called The Flies. Yes, yes. Neil was in a band called The Flies. And uh, I just loved it. I loved what was happening. And I thought, oh, I'd missed all this because I've been in love with Adrian and I've been over, the, you know, dancing away in Beirut or Japan or across in the Sahara Desert. But this is happening in England and it's now. And I got really involved as a, as a punter. I went to gigs all the time, all the time. Um, to the 100 Club, to the Marquee, to the Roxy, to um, a gig that Sex Pistols did 
at, um, I can't remember its name, College, west of uh, London, which was amazing, because people were jumping off of the blooming speakers. Oh, Sham 69 was the best one that I remember though, because I, I, and I'd go on my own, but uh, remember Sham were playing, and I thought they were great. The minute they started to sing, everybody's jumping up and down, and I'm on a stool, because I can't see, and then I fell off the stool, and as I fell off the stool, I leant down, to, and I thought I'd grabbed something, and I grabbed this man's willy by mistake. <laughs> And he, and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and it was just a time of excitement and happiness. And yeah, and it wasn't anything that like the press had written about, you know, that everybody's sort of do, do me in black. And um, it just wasn't like that. I didn't find it like that anyway. So I said to my brother, how did you get that record deal? What do you do? And he said, you've got to write songs. And I said, how do you do that? Show me. And he showed me. And what did he say that was so helpful? He said to me that if you have people that you like, different artists, study how they write a song, that's number one. If you're writing lyrics, don't, you don't have to write it overtly. If you want to be clever, get some metaphors on the go. Um, and so I chose as my models was the small faces because I loved the small faces. And I loved things like Ichiku Park, Friday on my mind. <coughs> oh, loads, Here Come the Nice. Because they were perfect pop songs. And they had a, a perfect structure, which is verse, bridge, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus, middle eight, bridge, chorus. Two choruses and sayonara. And uh, that was the formula I started with. And Neil and his band, The Flies, demoed three songs with me. Um, and they were a bit obscure because I, I had this idea about making a poster and putting it all over London because I'd seen this, um, this thing that was going on all in the tubes at that time. There was this huge picture of a very good looking guy called Johnny Cougar. That was before it became John yeah. Mellencamp Cougar, old Cougar, Mellencamp, I don't know which way around. But anyway, and he was more or less a model. Um, that's, I didn't even know what he did. I just saw his face everywhere. And I thought, what a gorgeous looking guy. Who is he? What does he do anyway? And it wasn't clear. And I thought that was great that I should note it and therefore everybody else notes it. So I thought, that's what you do. You make a, <laughs> you make a poster and you slap it up everywhere. Um, so I made his poster, which, <laughs> which is when it starts to get obscure. It said, where is Montana Wild Hack? And all my mates in the, you know, the music industry, then like Rusty Egan and S Steve New and all that, they said, oh, we saw your poster up over the tubes. But, you know, what is it? Who is Montana Wild Hack? I said, that's it. Who is Montana Wild Hack? Montana Wild Hack was uh, a porn star in a Kurt Vonnegut um, Jr. story called Slaughterhouse Five. And I loved Slaughterhouse Five. So all my first songs were about Montana Wild Hack or Billy Pilgrim, which was the main character. And I... But what would be the connection between him and you? <laughs> God knows. My brain is nuts. I just thought that's where I'm coming from. And it was where I was coming from at that time. I don't know. That's... So you were publicising it? publicising someone that didn't really exist. Yes, because I thought they'll see my face and then they'll go, who, who, who is she anyway? Um, and anyway, and if they didn't know who she was, then I didn't want them to know me. I thought but something like that. that. I think you'd written a song or started to write a song, <laughs> didn't you? Do you remember the, what was the first song you wrote? Because you, anyway, in the book. Okay. It talks about the explosion which killed Ah, somebody. yes, and that song never got the airing because it was too... Uh, it was a song that I wrote about... Um, there was an explosion in... Barclay Square. Barclay Square. And I'd read in the newspaper that um, a man had gone to have his sandwiches, to have his lunch break. And he was actually, I think, one of the only victims. And he was, he was dead from just going to have his lunch. And I felt that was so sad and so poignant and so what's going on in our times. Therefore, I'd started to write a song about people trying to make a love connection. You drink yeah. your coffee, I sip my tea. Um, 
and that will they get off with each other or not. And then the next part of the song was, but at the same time as this is happening, as in babies are being made, people are dying and a bomb goes off in Barclay Square. And that was the content of that song originally, which became Will You? Yeah. But in those days, it was the work in progress was that it was a, an ironic song with both faces, you know, of love and sex and bombs and death. Um, yeah, but I never showed it to anyone. And then when Breaking Glass came along in my life and they said, have you got a love song? I said, I've sort of got a love song. And um, I showed it to him. And that's when Tony Visconti decided, he told me later that he wanted to produce me. So let, let's just spin a little song. bit. So we'll yep. stack a little bit so we get the story of Breaking yep. Glass. So the demos that you had got you <laughs> a deal at Albion Records, mm -hmm. two guys, mm -hmm. Derek Savage, Di Davis, mm -hmm. and they had 999 in Gong, the Stranglers, they had quite an impressive roster at the time. Yeah. Um, and you signed with them, you later obviously came to regret that because yes. uh, they tied you to a contract which was uh, quite long term, but you were on reception one day at Albion Records yeah. and you get, you get a phone call. Okay. I'm on the reception because Albion only gave me a quid for my record deal, which of course was ridiculous, but I didn't know that. I just wanted to be signed. You know, it's like these foolish people you see going, I just want to be a star. Ridiculous, you don't give yourself away that cheaply. But I did, and I didn't have any money. The telephonist had gone on holiday at Albion Records. So I said, can I have the job for two weeks while she's on holiday? And my first day of work, lunchtime, Everybody had gone out, it was just me. Phone rings. Can we speak to somebody about Hazel O'Connor, singer on your label? I was told it was me. And they said, no, 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 darling. This one's an actress, a singer. No, no, no. And I said, no, it's me. I'm answering the phones as well. And uh, so we, we ended up straightening that out. And I went for an audition at United Artists. And uh, when I was in the place to do the audition, it was pretty horrible because there was loads of really, really well-known people. Um, Toya was there. Toya yeah. came in and yeah. I knew Toya from, we used to rehearse in her warehouse in South London. And the minute I saw Toya, I thought, well, this is stupid, you know, she's an actress, I've seen her. Uh, I know what she does, she's known and I'm just nobody and I should just leave, which is my picture of myself quite often, you know, being useless. And I'd actually been, one of the guys at Albion that worked there had taken me to see a faith healer some weeks, months before, I can't remember. And she'd given me a book. She hadn't done any hocus pocus, just gave me a book and said, read this. I think this will be very handy for you. I read it and it was about... Bring out the magic in your mind. Yes, by al Quran, And it was about visualisation and believing that the universe will bring to you something if you ask for it and and you lay yourself open and you prepare for it so I started to prepare I thought I'd do it as an experiment to be honest I was just experimenting going yeah yeah of course this works uh. and then I decided I'm going to do it really with full full vigor and I'm going to imagine that something amazing is coming to me it's really sick, it's mad. And I did, and every morning I woke up and I said, something amazing is coming to me. I don't know what it is, but it's just gonna change my life. So amazing. And then that phone call happened. And, and when that happened, it actually quite freaked me out. Because I thought, oh no, what's happening? And then the next minute I'm in United Artists and I'm looking at Toya just walking in and other people coming in that I knew from reading about them in the music papers. And I lost my, you know, my guts, and I thought, I'm going to go, I'm just going to run away. And then I stopped myself and said, why do you always do that, girl? And I always do that because I'm afraid of losing or being rejected. And that's why most people do that. You know, this can be something that's just over the horizon that's yours and belongs to you. And instead of going for it, you go, oh, I'm not sure, I don't think I'm really worthy of it, I can't... And I didn't. I 
just for a second in my life, I stopped myself, checked myself, didn't look at the script because the script was horrible at that time. But I looked at the passage in the book that said, you just have to believe that something is there for you in this life. And I started to imagine things that would I would want, you know, and um, I wanted to, <laughs> and then it became far-fetched to anybody, you know, hearing this story. I wanted to become the lead of that film. It was usually uh, originally about a man, not a woman. The film was not going to be about a girl lead singer. But I, in my mind, said, no, it's going to be a girl singer. It's going to be um, the, a new script. They're going to ask me, obviously, to play the lead. And then the bonus would be they're going to ask me to write the songs because I wanted to get away from Albion. And then when they say, do you want to write the songs, they're going to say, what producer do you want? And I'm going to say, Tony Visconti, David Bowie's producer, because I was a big, Dave, or I am a big David Bowie fan. And with that inside me, I went into the audition and it was different. I was different for a minute. I was confident and I did the audition and the next minute they're saying, give her another piece of script. Give her the one about the bass player in the band. And I thought, yeah, we're getting there. And then they said, and you know, where have you been? Where do you, what's your story? Um, have you got an equity acting, you know, union card? And I said, yes, actually, I got that when I was a dancer in Beirut in Japan. And they went, yeah, very interesting. You were in Lebanon, yes? And I said, yeah, civil war started there. And of course, I didn't know in those days, right? But I understand now marketing and PR and talking. If you've got something to say, you got, you know, your quid's up on somebody that just goes, yeah, no, yeah. No. They want someone with guts and character to do that. Yeah, and who's got a story to tell. And I certainly had stories, so the next, as you can tell. <laughs> and so um, then they said, you got any songs? And I lied. I said, I've got zillions, loads. And I only had three or four at that time, which was the song, Will You? Which I never showed to people. And the three songs I demoed with my brother's band, The Flies. And the stuff I'd started to do with uh, Albion. So yeah, and, that's, and then it developed into, I got the part few months later so you got the part and then how did you write all those songs there's some great songs in that film it's not amazing i'm so oh, excited about that wow i don't know as a little bon tempo kiddie organy thing i went to my friend's nan's house in port slade and locked myself away for a week and i also had to oh i had to diet at the same time because i was too i was only eight stone but i had to be a stone less because film makes you look fat so i was there dieting on the special atkinson diet Ugh, never do that again atkins. yeah uh, yes atkins okay. diet um protein only and oof, i wouldn't do that now because i'm vegetarian but in those days i wasn't i lost me weight i wrote the songs but where did the ideas the, what, where yes. the ideas come from margaret thatcher because i disliked the woman so much I disliked what was happening politically in England. There was loads to write about. And once a person like me gets a platform to say it from, there's no stopping me. Okay, you've got the lyrics, but where'd you get, where, where'd you get the, the, the tunes from? I don't know, just da di da di da and So they just, come, they just came to you? Yeah, and, I, and because I'm not a, you know, I'm not a musician. You weren't, exactly, you weren't trained as a musician. No, but you see, a few years before, a drummer I knew was playing drums one minute and then the next minute he's playing a song on a piano and I was mystified I said how can you do that you're a drummer you know like everybody's got to just be one thing and he said oh it's easy Hayes you just do this and he showed me the chord of C and how the chords worked and because I've got um, some kind of dyslexic OCD condition <laughs> that I live with I see things in patterns and if somebody shows me something in a pattern and the piano, you know, I played a bit of guitar, but it was really difficult. It hurts your fingers and all this. But the piano was something I could see. It was like, you know, three black notes, two black notes and all the rest are white. And it's a picture that my hands understood and my brain understood. And, and I, I, it was like a whole world opening up. It was amazing, a, a wonderful discovery. And then to have something to write for, the minute that clicked in, 
I just wrote, I couldn't stop writing. It was great, but I won't do things if I've got no reason for doing them because I'm lazy. But I still find it extraordinary. You had no musical training. You just needed a few chords. Mm. Like a lot of us do, we're young, we learn a few chords. And then you were able to write some great songs in a week. Well, I think it's because I, I didn't listen to anything else. I just listened to myself. And I was at my friend's nan, nan's house. She put me up and so it's just me and nan and me, me funny diet, walk down the beach every day in Port Slade, go back and just, just listen to things and sing tunes and think about things. It was a great moment in my life because I had time and I had a reason, time yeah. and a reason. Time to do it, reason was where we were at in this country, in England at that time. So you were given a challenge, you were given opportunity yeah. and you wanted to take it 100%. Took it. Yeah. Working class opportunist. Yeah, no, I understand yeah. that. And then the film almost fell apart. And then someone called Dodie Fired. Yeah. Who became very famous later. Yeah, he, he took he, it over. The, they, you know, United Artists had funded the pre-production and then they were heavily into a film called Heaven's Gate. Uh, Which had terrible reviews, but I really, I, really I liked Heaven's yeah. Gate, yeah, because yeah, I watched great. it years later, yeah. thinking, yeah. well, that was the, that was the film that stopped Breaking Glass nearly happening, okay. um, and so the producers lost the backing from United Artists, but by this time they'd got me and they'd got Phil Daniels, they'd cast a whole lot of things, and they'd got demos that I'd now done with Tony Visconti, and they took their little package off to Cannes Film Festival. And at the same time, unbeknownst to us, so this is synchronicity again, magic of the universe. Mohammed Al Fayed had given Dodi three million quid to go and, you know, go shopping at Cannes and see if you can find a project to um, to invest in for their company. So Dodi found Breaking Glass, and we found each other, and the film started production. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It was meant to happen. I guess. And it was part, maybe partly because you read that book. Maybe. I mean, I like to think that. But when I do think that, also, the, or when I did think that in the past, it also became quite a burden. Because it's scary when you think that those things do happen in life. It's a, it's a responsibility. And uh, I think there was points in time when I couldn't live up to that responsibility. Yeah. But the film came out. Film came out. It was out. finished, the soundtrack came out. Da, da, da. Yeah. And I got some awards and things, yeah. which was amazing. I remember going to the BAFTA Awards because I was nominated for Best Newcomer Actress and Best Soundtrack. And my other people in the soundtrack, and you know, was John Williams and Flash. Ah! Uh, you know, Queens. Um, Mercury. Yeah, for the That's Flash cool. film, yeah. Okay. And me, Breaking Glass. And that was enough, you know, just to be nominated. And when I had arrived at the BAFTAs, I bumped into Sting. And I'd known Sting beforehand because I used to see him at my friend's studio recording when he was, you know, still a grumpy teen... Uh, not teenager, teacher. <laughs> grumpy teacher. You know, recording with the police, early tracks. And he said, hello, Hayes. I said, well, hello. You know, gave him a kiss, hug. He says, ah. Oh, I'm one of the people voting for the film soundtracks. He said, I saw your film, it's brilliant. He said, I voted for it. He said, but I don't think the others quite got it. <laughs> As in the other people, you know, voting. So um, I thought, well, that's fine. I don't mind. I don't mind losing to, actually, it was John Williams that took that award. Yeah. That's just the fact that I was nominated was enough for me. Yeah. And uh, and then and then another one came up. I was told I was got to go to somewhere and a Savoy or Ritz or something to go and get an award. I'd actually been awarded an award, so I assumed it was another one of these best newcomer things. And so uh, they wanted a photographer to come to my house that morning, and I'd asked Richard Jobson of the Skids to be my escort, but he'd been out on the tiles all night. He turns up at my house, what, hungover. I go, come on, Jobby, get yourself together. You're my escort today. Photographer arrives to take me picture, as they do, you know, to get it in the papers for that night. And he said, oh, I wished I'd know, known you just lived down here in West Hampstead because um, you're opposite 
I don't know what you call it, you know, the person you're twinned with, the other person getting the same award, your male counterpart. There we go, counterpart is living just up the road in Hampstead. And I said, oh, and who's that? He said, oh, John Hurt, he's got best actor. And I said, no, no, I haven't got best actress. I'm best newcomer. He says, no, you're best actress, 1980. Ha, so exciting. <laughs> that was great. That was like a high point for me. And one thing we left out was you did meet David Bowie and he offered to write some songs for Breaking Glass and you turned him down. He said, no. <laughs> yeah. He was already written them. Thank you, David. Very kind. How you but you turn down David Bowie writing the songs? How do you? Uh, I, well, because I was a spunky little monkey yeah. at that time. Uh, I was so excited to meet him. Tony Visconti had said, come in tonight if you want to meet David Bowie. He's recording. And he was recording for the Kenny Everett show. And he was doing an acoustic version of Ground Control to Major Tom. <gasps> so I, I go into the studio, we're watching recording. There's a woman there called Coco, Corinne, who used to be his assistant and sort of managed him. And she's a little formidable, a bit scary, uh, because I'd heard about her and I thought, mm, she's a really tough woman. Sitting there watching and he comes out and Tony takes us into his office says, um, you know, this is David and it's Hazel and Hazel's just done a film called Breaking Glass and we shook hands and then David said, oh, Breaking Glass, they, did they name it after my song? <laughs> That's when I went, no, we actually thought of that title, you know, ourselves. Um, and uh, I didn't go as far as saying, do you have a song called Breaking Glass? I know. And, and then he said, you know, I could write some songs for you if you want for the film. And I thought, no. I said, we've already recorded them, actually, but thank you. And uh, that was number two question. One, two. Then number three question was, you cut Tony's hair, don't you? Yes. Will you give me a haircut? <laughs> and I was in seventh heaven. I didn't have hairdressing scissors or anything with me. I just had uh, some really crappy things from the cupboard of the office and uh, dirty tea towels around his neck. And he was so nice. I mean, you imagine putting dirty tea towels around the neck of your hero and then chopping their hair and feeling the skull and go, who is this guy? It was great. It was lovely. And then at the end of all that, he said he was going to come to a gig, which is things I read about in music papers, you know, that so-and-so came to see, you know, some big star comes to see some little, you know, starlet or star in the making. And the fact that he was going to come and see me was like, yes! And he came to see you supporting Iggy Pop. Yes, he did. He came to see me playing with Iggy Pop and um, not biblically playing with Iggy Pop, by the way. Uh, I was supporting yeah. Iggy Pop doing two nights, but the first night he didn't turn up. So I thought, mm, it's just what, the, you know, people, stars, they make all these promises and then they never come. And I lost the plot a bit and I decided I wasn't going to carry on singing anyway because the audience really hated me and I was not going to do this again. But I had my second night to play, and that was the time in my career where I decided that I was probably going to stop singing because maybe I was a pastiche. So it wasn't working life for you then? Well, it, it, I was very, very put off by being told to get off the stage. Of course. <laughs> I was really depressed. I was crying that night when I was putting petrol in my car. But, um, but I did, I had this devil be care attitude about the one thing I wanted to do was play the soppy song Will You yeah. to an audience because I'd not done that and it's a little bit like not that I've got a beautiful body but say you had a beautiful body but you never showed it to anybody or a beautiful heart or a beautiful mind a beautiful soul you don't reveal it all and you don't reveal it because you're scared that you're going to look like a, an idiot or a softy, and that's how I felt about Will You. I did not want to show anybody it because I felt naked showing it, and I didn't feel I was up to being naked. And at that moment, the second night, I'd said to the band, do you know something, I, I don't know whether I want to do singing anymore because it's obviously not working, and uh, you know they all hate me, and if they're the same like tonight, go and get off, you silly cow, and all this, I'm going to do get us all to do will you so we can at least do it once in front of an audience and at that point um we you know they still go get off and uh, 
I said, OK, Lance, let's do Will You. So I said, this is a slow song. We started to play it. And by the time we got to the sax solo, um, the whole audience were just kind of embracing each other. And <laughs> when they used to be able to light lighters, you know, doing all this, lighters in the air, hands in the air. And uh, they were saying, you know, going, we love you. <laughs> Which was so lovely. And also David had turned up. I looked at him because I didn't know what to do because usually, you know, the sax solo, we've not had a usual, we've never done sax solo before. So I went to the back of the stage, kind of tried to get out of the light because it was, you know, the time for Wesley McGugan's moment to do his sax solo. And I looked to the wings and there was David. And I went like that. So what, what, what changed in the audience, do you think? I, uh, this is my take on it. I should always be, it's taught me to always be brave. Yes. To always, even if you're going to be made a fool of, you know, laughed at. And I think that's a message to, to the whole world. We should always show that nakedness because when we do, you connect with humanity in a much deeper level. And I think that's what happened. I think that song connected and, and connects with people on a much deeper level than even I gave it credit for. It's about being yourself, really. Yeah, and, and, and showing one's vulnerability. Yeah. Mm. And I think by showing my vulnerability, it's like, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. When I showed mine, the audience showed me theirs. And that's kind of the relationship I've had ever since in this music And was business. that generally a turning point in your, in your live yeah. performances? Yeah. Totally, totally. And I've learned so much from it. I mean, I've, I've learned more since about the nakedness of a performer yeah. and how to, how to not be afraid in that way. So talk more about that, how that is for you. Okay, for example, I lately, you know, in, these, in the last 20 years, <laughs> it's lately, um, I started to do some acoustic gigs. Yes. And I started to do them because actually Herbie Flowers, the bass player, um, had said to me, Hayes, you should really go and talk about your life in Edinburgh Festival and you should just do an acoustic set like, um, what's his face from the Kinks? Ray Davis. Had been doing a great show and everybody was loving it. And I said, ooh, that's very scary, ooh. <laughs> And then I thought about it because Herbie always has great ideas and he's always got my best interest at heart. And he does a show like that because he, he's a talker. He's yeah. a Taurus like me. We both are. Oh, oh, oh. And, uh, and I, so I went away, took this, and then he phoned me again. He said, Hazel, you should come to Edinburgh this year. There's a slot in the same place as I'm playing. Get on to it. I've asked him. You can do it. Think about it do it don't think about it do it so i did i booked the space and then i got together with the harp player that i work with a lot cormac de Barra, and i said do you fancy doing this and we worked a show which was just harp and voice and telling stories and making a big noise making a small noise and um it, i realized the strength in in taking your clothes off metaphorically yeah. in front of an audience completely because when you do it when you do that when you're very very just two of you you are absolutely naked if you make a cock up you have to own it and cock ups happen yeah it, but the audience would normally be, be, be they'll go with, with you. you yeah i mean i remember one time singing a really i think it was the beginning of will you and i went you drink your I get a frog in my throat and all the people are just going eh, eh. and so I have to own it and then I say actually ladies and gentlemen I may have to start that again because that's what we call a gobby you know when you... <laughs> and uh, then, then then they laugh and then we we relax a bit more they like the humanness yes because that's what it is it's and I remember I remember just try to interrupt you but there's something else that David Bowie talk, taught you or said to you which I thought was oh, interesting yeah. in the book it oh was, <laughs> this is what David taught me, because when, when I saw him again, properly, um, I think it was actually at that gig that he came, you know, to, or maybe it was in the studio because there was some charity thing happening. I can't remember exactly, but it was in that time when I was hugely famous and hugely mobbed. And I was a little bit like, 
a rabbit in the headlights and I had been used to freedom and suddenly I wasn't free anymore. I was very constricted by my fame. And I said, oh, David, I don't know what to do. It's really scary. Everybody wants to be my friend. I just not very good at it. And he said, you've got to remember this. Every person that's a fan that comes to talk to you, they have read about you and they know things about you. You know nothing about them. And the only way you can even the whole playing field is that you have to engage and you have to find one fact out about them, even if it's what's your name, where do you live, what's your job, anything, engage. And then you even it out and then it becomes a human interchange yeah. and not like fan, star, <sighs> And, and I loved that. I mean, then you have the choice. I mean, say people like David, so blooming famous. Um, <laughs> we are not worthy. He, he can, you know, obviously whoever's famous has the choice to, you know, go in secure ways and be behind the tough guys and all that. Um, whatever they want. Personally, I have found my journey is a lot easier to face it. I used to be scared of crowds because people would be all over me, touching me and pulling me scarf off and do da da. But then I decided, if I let that happen to me, it's that again, not that like, it's like having the V on the, on the forehead. I can't be a victim of it. I have to be in the middle of it. So if there's a, a mobbing going on, I'll just say, ah, it's space, human being. <laughs> and, um, and people respect that. They learn to respect it. We have to. We all have to learn from each other, and that's the way I deal with it. And I've never been scared of my public ever again. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember years and years ago having having a lunch with Herbie Flowers because I was a mm. huge um, Bowie fan as well. And I'd say how much I like Bowie, what brilliant songs. And he said the thing about David is, is that he doesn't have all that confidence, much confidence in his songwriting. He's always trying to better himself. Yeah. And I thought, and that was the relatively early stage of his career, that was Ziggy Stardust. Yeah. Um, time when you look, you look back, he, he changed his career so much in terms of the yes, music. Yes, just kept moving And it's it. like this thing of always trying to better yourself. Yeah. And if I look at your career, okay, you're never famous as, as David Bowie, but you've survived all those, all those years doing what you love. You've changed a lot. You've written songs for 15 albums, a lot of them in very different. Yeah. So it's kind of in your own way, you've taken that as well, haven't you? Always trying to better your songwriting, come up with something new. Yes, and I, I want to do that because that's, the, that's life's challenge. Yeah. It's not just, you, I know that we're talking about music or a career, or, but it can be applied to every single walk of life. Whatever we do in life, we have to keep moving and growing. Because if we don't, we become stagnant, smelly pools. <laughs> stagnant smelly pool. Yeah, I don't want to be a stagnant smelly pool, do no. I? No. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering how much more to cover. There's a, in a way, we've only, only covered the first few years of your career, and you've you've worked, as I said earlier, for all the time, pretty much. I think what was very difficult was was for you that you had a legal dispute with Albion Records, yeah. and that froze the money from yeah. Will You and the other big hits. So actually, a lot of that time, you're on the breadline. Yeah, I was on the breadline. Well, I'm still on the breadline. I'm always going to be on the breadline. That's just how it is. Because uh, there is this thing in the music industry, which, of course, I didn't know. If somebody had told me really clearly earlier on, I would have been a bit more astute, I suppose, that the, those two years are the magic two years. They're the ones when you make, you make and break deals financially. But I didn't care about money. I just was happy that my record was getting played. So uh, and you I know, understand that. Too. Mia culpa. Yeah. Um, and after the you know the the business disputes, um, and and the fact that I couldn't do live work anymore because people had to be paid, and I didn't have money to pay them. When I when everything went pear shaped. I was owing about £35,000 and my accountant said, you better go bankrupt. And I, I thought about the people that I worked with, um, like my lights man, my sounds man, um, and what bankruptcy 
would mean to them my bankruptcy would mean they wouldn't get paid yes. and I knew their families and I thought I can't do that I won't do that so I didn't do that you know slowly all my debts were paid um, and when I did pay everybody um, their fees and how it worked I had I think 700 quid left because I said to me Candy, well what's left and he said 700 pounds and I said right I'm gonna go on holiday to Morocco then <laughs> And I went on holiday to Morocco, had a great time, made my first really lifelong friend called Munia, who is to play chess with every day. I went with my mate Sally and whilst we were there, um, it was the best time ever and we went back to the airport to come home and there was no plane because Laker had gone bankrupt and I was stuck there. And um, my friend cried her eyes out for a minute and I didn't because I don't act like that. I act react about two days after the fact. Eventually we got home and, and then I started to deal with what I had to deal with. And um, it took me on a different course. It took me into jazz because uh, I wasn't allowed to do big gigs anymore, but I could do some little gigs, which is when I started to work with Claire Hurst of the Bell Stars, who I still work with now. Um, we worked with a, her and a girl called Nikki Holland, who was part of Funboy 3 and then uh, Tears for Fears. So the three of us had a trio in the early 80s and Island Records were going to do a deal with us and it was very exciting and then it all fell through, you know, the way things do. And I got used to, you know, it, but it didn't matter because as long as there was a project that I loved doing, it really didn't matter because that was what was important. That was what was important. Yeah. Hey, so we have to finish in about three or four minutes. Um, one of the things that you finish your book with, which is a, is a few years old, but it's still, it's still current in many, many ways, is that now you still don't have very much money, but you have a passion for building, and you've been at your house in France, you've been putting an extension on, but you don't have the money, but you're happy most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. That's what you say in the book anyway. Oh, yeah, most of the time, most yeah. of the time happy. I'm about the same as everybody else, really. I just... Actually, no, I'm not very glum often um, because I've got, I've got really marvellous, wonderful friends that are like family. Um, and I have my dogs. I walk my dogs. I do normal things. And I love building. And, you know, I built that place in France from the ground up literally had no floor no nothing I did everything and I learned how to do that and that was another one of those challenge things I love the challenge and if somebody sets me a challenge I'll succeed at it I won't succeed if I have to set myself the challenge because I'm too lazy but the minute a challenge presents itself I go for it like a, a mad thing and you still work and do gigs Big time, yeah. I mean, that's, you I'd say. That, huh? Yeah, if I didn't love her, I wouldn't yeah. be able to do it because yeah. it would be too much hassle. Yeah. You're doing a new album, you were telling me earlier? Yeah, well, uh, I've done a new album with Cormac DeBar on the harp. That's just yes. a very simple album, but it's something we needed to do because we haven't done one for about 15 years. And then the girls and I will probably record in the next couple of months. And then, then we'll see. Then it'll be next year and the next year until I suppose the day I die. I mean, I hate that thought. I do think sometimes I make a joke of it, but it'll probably be like that for me. You know, I'll be singing one day like just Tommy Cooper was going just like that. And you know, if, it, if my death comes to me on the stage, singing a song that's making people feel moved, I'll be happy. And that's where I think uh, probably my, my talent or whatever comes is that I do have a talent of moving people, their insides, not in a physical way, but in a, in a heart and soul way. Absolutely. Yeah. Hazel, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much for coming along. Thank you. And thank you people out there for watching Cherry Red TV. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. Come to the dark